Thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna wait a couple minutes to kick things off uh, and then we'll get started. For those just joining, we'll give it just a few more minutes here to let people dial in and then we'll kick it off. We are still getting attendees, so we'll give it just a couple more seconds and then we'll go ahead and jump in. We've still got some folks joining. I'm just gonna give it a little bit longer. Sound like a broken record, I'm sorry, but we'll kick it off soon, I promise. All right, hello and welcome. My name is Derek Croson and I head up partnerships here at Open Asset. And as your moderator for today, I can truly say that we are all in for a treat. We're gonna be covering the topic of the top five InDesign techniques your proposals need now. And the good news is, is you don't have to hear that from me or hear me speak much longer. Uh, we have a special guest. You might be able to figure out who that is, uh, but I will be introducing her shortly. Real quick, I wanna cover off on some housekeeping. So at the end of the session, we're gonna provide 15 minutes for Q&A. Please use the button in Zoom to submit your questions and we'll do our best to get those answered. If not, we'll try to follow up with questions post-webinar. Okay, and so I just wanna give a quick background on open asset for those that might be unfamiliar. We are the first and only smart image library built with AEC professionals like you in mind. Our features like intuitive search, project tagging, customizable templates, help your team build proposals and resumes in a much more efficient manner than you know, traditional methods. You do have the ability to drag and drop assets or export templates into InDesign, hence why we're here today or you can use one of our many other integrations uh, to find the assets and the data that you need uh, or that your team needs. That's it. Um, if you have questions about open asset, we'll, we'll answer those later or maybe post call. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce your guide and expert for today's session. And that is none other than Julie Schaefer of Schaefer Creative. And Julie is a C, PSM. She is a award-winning designer and an Adobe certified instructor for the creative cloud design and layout solutions. 
Um, and I can honestly say she is very passionate about helping AEC marketers maximize their design tools and expedite their processes. And just a little bit of a fun fact about Julie. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but recently she was inducted into the SMPS North Texas Hall of Fame. So I think she deserves a round of applause. Um, as she has spent almost two decades honing her industry skills, and I have no inclination that she will stop anytime soon. And we are absolutely delighted to have her here with us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie and she's going to take you through the content. Take it away, Julie. Awesome. Derek, thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be part of this today. I love Open Asset. I love the product and I'm thrilled that I've been invited to talk to you today about top five, both in design, but really kind of design things. So the first thing though, I want to set some foundation and set some groundwork for what we're talking about today. My content is really around pursuits. So that could be statements of qualifications, proposals, presentations, all of those things that many of us have to work in, generally responding to some sort of prescriptive requirements. So when we're talking about pursuits, there are some macro goals that we need to, to, to discuss. And that is, first of all, as we all know, our first priority is to respond to the RFP or RFQ requirements. That is number one. If it tells us that we have to use 11 point aerial with one inch margins, that is our reality for that project. But secondly, we wanna make sure that we respect our firm's brand. So we wanna make sure that we have the colors, the fonts, all of the things that we're doing and using as part of our pursuit. The main thing though, is we must provide the reviewer with differentiating content that is digestible, relevant, and memorable. So those are three key things that we need to do because we have to understand that these reviewers are looking at multiple pursuits and they're making decisions based on the content, presumably, that's in them. So we really need to work hard on making sure that we give them really valuable content. And of course, we all know that we want to win and repeat, meaning get to work with that owner again. But for today, I have some micro pursuits. I wanna make sure that we are drawing the reader to each page. We need to guide them through the content and we need to keep them on the page as long as possible. So that's really kind of the framework for what I wanna talk about today how from a micro level, we can look at our content on each page to really guide the reader around. So for our agenda, we're gonna talk about hierarchy. So how we can create visual order within our documents. We'll talk about balance, repetition, creating action or a sense of movement, and of course, detail, which might be the most boring part of it, but it is the most critical part, making sure that we don't have any compliance issues or spelling issues. So to start off, let's talk about hierarchy. And I'm not talking about org charts. I'm not talking about pyramid graphics. I'm talking about what is the hierarchy of the structure on each page. So with all things being equal, and we only have text on a page, we know in Western culture that we read left to right, top to bottom. So every time the reviewer turns the page, they're gonna be drawn to the top left and they're gonna be anchored by the bottom right. So those are key elements to think about when we're thinking about some hierarchy. And again, when you throw images into the mix, that messes the whole thing up because images will really draw the reviewer first. So that left to right, top to bottom will be completely broken when we start adding images into our content. We all understand the power of image graphics. So a very safe layout would be having images on your page with a big one in the top left, a smaller one in the bottom right, and of course your text in the middle. So that's a kind of safe layout if you can do nothing else, and this is sometimes the reality, 
that is a really safe way to make sure that they see your images and read your content. But speaking of images, I also wanna say in the grand scheme of image hierarchy, the first thing that reviewers are gonna look at are faces. So we are drawn to faces in our imagery. So whenever you can put faces, then you should be good to go. But how else can we draw attention to our content? So knowing that we don't always have control of the faces, we don't have control necessarily of the kinds of images that we can use, we still need to create a hierarchy within our document in two key areas, one of which is color. And I do wanna pause here to make sure I'm not, I see an audio experience here. I wanna make sure that that is not on me if we're having audio issues. Derek, are we having audio issues? I am not, I am hearing you fine. Um, okay. But we'll check into this. Uh, we'll circle back. Bear with us. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure. Thank you. All right. So color. In the grand scheme of hierarchy, color can be the most powerful. Now, there's a lot we could talk about color. I don't have time to go into color theory and emotions tied to color or any of that. Because again, we're focused on an individual page, kind of the micro level drawing the reader in. So I really want to look at the color wheel in which colors recede versus which colors come out. So on the color wheel, the colors on the left here, those are the cooler colors. So your greens and blues and things, those tend to recede into the page, whereas warm colors, gold, orange, red, they tend to come out of the page. So that can be an important way in how we're communicating information but we also have to understand that red, especially in, in those, because they come out and our eyes see them so prominently, they're also used for caution or some sort of urgency. So in our layouts, although we know that our eyes are gonna go right to the red and gold and warmer tones, you just need to be thoughtful in how you use those colors. For example, a layout like this might be a little bit overwhelming for the reviewer. I feel like it's on fire. It's a little bit stressing me out because of all of the red. Same layout, softer tones, they're warmer. I think you can start to feel a little bit more relaxed looking at the exact same content, text content, but just using the cooler tones and having those kind of recede out just a little bit. So when we're talking about color and understanding that those warmer tones are going to come out and we might want to use them sparingly, but we likely have logos that are blue and green, or perhaps in this question, they're red and black. How do we complement our color palette and our swatches to make sure that we're not screaming at them all the time with red and still providing a color harmony within our document? So there are four kind of main color harmonies that we're going to talk about. And that is just right across from the color wheel from say blue is kind of in a gold tone. So you can start to build a swatches panel around that. Of course, triad gets kind of the three points of the color wheel. Analogous colors are colors that touch each other. And then compounds, we can really start to make some interesting color swatches doing that. Now, where do we find this in InDesign? We're gonna jump in right now and take a look at this little tip to create swatches in InDesign. So I'm gonna go to my InDesign panel here and navigate up to a page where I am ready to create swatches based on the two images on my page. So in my case, my logo is hot pink, so that can be somewhat overwhelming. So I'm gonna to navigate to the tools on the left to the color theme tool. It is the eyedropper that has three little squares next to it. So if you click on that and navigate to just my logo, 
So without even clicking anything, if I hover over, I get a blue square around the logo. That means InDesign is sampling the logo. And if I click one time, it's grabbing the three colors of my logo. Now, again, that eyedropper is, the color theme tool is underneath the eyedropper on the left. So if you click on eyedropper and hold, you'll see the color theme pop up. So with that, I have the three colors of my logo, which is a great way to sample maybe an owner logo or some other graphic that you want the colors from that graphic. So from here, I could add these to my swatches with this little icon. Now, what I actually wanna do is gonna, I'm gonna escape out of that, hover back over the pink of my logo, and this time hold the shift key down. When I hold shift, my icon changes, and now if I click one time, I get those colors that can complement my pink. So I have analogous, monochromatic, triad, complementary, compound, and shades. So I have the all of these color options available to me that I can add any or all of them to my swatches panel and know that, say, the triad version is going to match my color really well in print. So I don't have to worry about pulling out color books and all the things, I can simply use the color theme tool. So I can click on that, add the swatches. And now in my swatches panel, I have two new folders that are showing me my themes. So if I escape out of that, maybe hover down here over an image, maybe I don't want the colors from my logo, but I really like the colors from this image. I can just click one time, and it samples kind of it's hard to see there, but kind of the deep blue and purples and the golds of the image. Then if I click the drop down next to it, I have options to keep it colorful, bright, dark, deep, or muted, and add those to my swatches. Or I'm gonna escape out. If I click and drag over just part of the image and I'm dragging over this kind of teal area on the left, it's only gonna sample those colors. So it's a really powerful tool to be able to create some colors, some color swatches in InDesign so that you have them available to you right here. So let me go back to presentation. All right, so if we know that color is really important, how does size fit in? And we all know size bigger is better, right? So our eyes are gonna be drawn to size and color. So wouldn't it be glorious if we could have something like this? The hierarchy on this page does not follow the left, right, top to bottom. The hierarchy follows based on size and color. So I have a giant header in the middle. I have a slightly bigger one above it. Then the third thing that you might read, and you can kind of navigate through this page and really guide the reader just based on the hierarchy here, only using size with a pinch of color. But we often don't have those options, right? I mean, that's a lot of real estate for our 10 page limit, 11 point aerial font. Because the reality is we're doing proposals and cramming content in is the name of the game. So. How do we create a meaningful hierarchy of our headers and things that still would be mathematically reasonable, but also would help us separate our text out? And for that, or if we don't have that option yet, we can create the illusion of larger. So this is a table that honestly, the text in this table is all the same size. All I did was create an illusion that option four is a little bit bigger or fatter, it's actually not. And that that's the one to draw the eyes to that table. So again, if you're totally limited on font, you can play with some tools like that. But we also can create the hierarchy with type scales. So there are several schools of thought about how the type scales work as far as our body as it relates to header sizes and caption sizes and things. This is a big question that I get a lot. Like if our body style is 12 point, how do I know the appropriate size for the subhead or the next level header? You know, what, what is right, what is wrong? 
And I love this because it gives us kind of four options. We have what's called the major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and golden ratio. Now this page will be in your handout, so you don't have to write it down, but it really can be very helpful in how you're creating some of your typography structure in your document. And what you do is you start with the body style and multiply if you're going up or divide if you're going down. So we're going to go back into InDesign and figure out how do we do that because I'm a Bachelor of Arts major. I don't want to be doing all of the math and calculating by 10 times 1.168 for golden ratio or any of that. And the beauty in InDesign is that you can do math. Any field in InDesign can perform the four basic math functions, which is amazing. So let's go back into InDesign again. Oops. And let me go down here to some text. And what I mean by that, performing the functions, I'm going to zoom in. And here is my body style. In the control panel across the top, it's 10-point font. And if I need, say, heading five, which is also currently in the same 10 point, I need that to be the next style up using, say, the golden ratio calculation. That's 1.618. It's the perfect ratio in nature. I can go into the field where it says 10 point, hit the asterisk on my keyboard, which is shift eight, which is multiply 1.618. And that gets me 16.18 for the, the text. Super easy. I could do that again, maybe heading four. I want that to be 16.18 times 1.618. And you can keep building your styles based on those calculations, knowing that mathematically, they're gonna work out really well as far as the structure of your typography goes in your typography's hierarchy. Now, another fun thing since we're here, obviously you would want to create paragraph styles based on these simply by selecting the text and you can create a new style automatically by holding down Option or Alt to create a new style. Or if you're interested in a script for several of them at one time, there is a script that you can run, and I'm happy to share that with you if you want to reach out to me after this. So there is a script to run it to create some auto styles. So that is using math throughout InDesign. Again, any of these fields can really, really help you in your layout. All right, let's go to the next area. Like I said, I have a lot to cover today. So we've already talked about the importance of color and size in our hierarchy and how we can create swatches. Of course, we can use math in our fields to create the type scales to start to build our style sheets. The next thing I wanna talk about is balance. So balance is key in how our page looks. It needs to be balanced. And one thing I've noticed for some coordinators is they get to the end of a section, there's just a little bit of text and just a photo. And so they get something like this. I have the text at the top of the page. The columns are not the same width. They're not even balanced. And then they kind of split the difference in the white space at the bottom, feeling like somehow they need to fill up the text or fill up the page. And you actually don't. In fact, what I recommend that you do to create balance is to build yourself a series of columns and grids in InDesign and then align your content accordingly. So for this page, it's the same exact text and the same photo, but this time I have three columns at the top that are balanced with the image in the middle still giving me some white space at the bottom. So this is a much more balanced layout. Another layout, maybe you have four photos. And again, I've seen some fight the need to kind of spread them out to the corners of the page or to the margin lines, not necessary. Use another grid. So this is a two column by three row grid that I have built in on my pages. Super easy to line up your images 
to the grid. In fact, it's, they snap to a grid. So way better, way easier to create some balance in your layout. So that brings us to where do we do that in InDesign? I'm gonna go to just a blank page here and zoom out. And it's on my, I'm using a B parent. So I'm gonna double click on the B parent, make that one the active one. And I'm just gonna show you what I do for this to work. I tend to get really overwhelmed if there's all kinds of guides going on all over the page. Um, however, I really want the guides sometimes. So I'm going to go to the layers panel. We're mostly on layer one for our document, but let's go ahead and create a new layer and I'll call my new layer two columns and click okay. Now this new layer is on the parent page and I can navigate to the top menu, layout, create guides and turn on two columns from here. Now we're not seeing it because I am in normal or in preview mode. So there we have it. There are two columns here on a two column layer. You can even change their color, by the way, if you wanna right click ruler guides. I like to change the color of my guides to the same color as the layer. So I did a right click to ruler guides to make those red. So it's really obvious that they're on my two column layer, which is red. And now on my pages, I could have that turned on or from the layers panel, I can just toggle it off. So with the eyeball, I can toggle that two column guide, the two column guides on and off, and I can continue building more. So I could build three columns, four columns, two by three grid, four by six grid, all of the things just as their own little layers all on your main parent page. And then you have the flexibility to turn those on and off. Really, really interesting and really great way to work with layers within your layout. Now, I recently wrote an article on layers for Creative Pro Magazine. So at the end of this, I have a QR code if you want to access that, um, I will show that to you. All right, let's go back in to our tips. So creating the guides. And now we want to align objects. Now, again, creating balance. Sometimes you get frames on your page that simply are not aligned very well. And I've often seen a lot of coordinators really struggle with how to really align a bunch of shapes um, correctly. And there's an align panel in InDesign. So it's under the top menu window, object and layout. And if we go to, let's say the align area, I'm gonna open up the align panel. And here I have nine little blocks. If I select them all, and I wanna align them to the page, actually want to just select the middle one and align it to the page and make sure the middle one is good and centered. So I did that when it's aligned to the page. Now I'm going to change the alignment to the margins and make sure these top three are aligning to the margins and the bottom three to the margins. Then of course I can zip through, I can select over all three of the middle ones, hold down the command or control key and make the middle the key object so that I can align the other two to the middle. Then of course we can just kind of make sure you turn those margins off and kind of play around with aligning these how you want to. But the other thing, let me align those to the center, is we also have the option to distribute spacing. And this is the one that most people miss. So underneath align, there's the ability to distribute spacing. And I'm gonna choose the middle one again as my key object and now create perfect spacing between these elements. It's pretty tight. Let's increase that to 0.1875. Super easy to then have perfect alignment between your elements just by distribute spacing. So I'll be honest, it, I worked many years in InDesign before I even noticed that. And it's tremendously helpful 
especially for org charts. So a lot you can do here in the align panel, definitely check out the distribute spacing. All right, Let's see how we're doing here. We keep going. The next one is around repetition. So we've already talked about how you're gonna add your swatches, right? You're gonna add the swatches to your swatches panel. Hopefully those will be the swatches that you use in your document. So the color would be consistent. We've also talked about creating that hierarchy structure in your typography. Once you add those as paragraph styles, we wanna make sure that you're using those for repetition. So the bottom, the end of the day, using styles not only can make your life tremendously easier, but you need to be using them for efficiency and cohesiveness and to really make your documents stand out. Now I can spend hours and hours talking about styles, but I do wanna point out there are five that you should be using, paragraph, character, object, table, and cell styles. So use all of those. We can really, really create interesting pages and layouts that are consistent for our pursuits. And if we have some time at the end, I can show you more about styles. But what I really wanted to talk about is action. How can we create action on our pages when we are limited to a static eight and a half by 11 deliverable, right? Likely it's getting printed. We have to assume it is. So we have no opportunity for video or any kind of interactivity in, in our current scenario. So how do we create action in the absence of actual action? In one way is to imply movement. So this image has a lot of energy happening. Not only do we have faces, so that's a plus, but we can see that there's some movement within the image and that is drawing us in as the reviewer to be able to see people moving around makes it very, very interesting Oops, on maybe a cover image or something like that. The same is true for maybe a fire truck. Maybe you're pursuing a fire station job and what could create more urgency in your layout than this fire truck zooming down the, down the road. So if you have the opportunity to choose photography that is either static, like a static truck parked in its bay, or this one moving, this one is certainly going to provide a lot more interest to the reviewer. Obviously, a lot of us do civil design, a lot of roads. I do not recommend that you take this photo and stand in the street for this, but have some action on the roads. I see a lot of just really boring plane. We stood at the road and took a picture of it, but it's really nice to have some that have some action and some interest happening. And as I mentioned, we really should be using people in our pursuits whenever we can. Reviewers are attracted to faces. Plus we wanna promote the people that work on our jobs. So when you have the opportunity of talking about construction, get a photo of someone actually doing it, get the action of the work that they're doing or get the action of the person walking through a warehouse. That's a little bit more interesting than just the warehouse floor. And certainly if you have some carpentry happening or something like that, much more interesting photo to have the action of the work actually being done. So it's nice to have the finished product, but it's also nice to see the work getting done and the people that are doing that work. But again, maybe we don't have action photos. Maybe we're stuck with text. So here I have five blocks of text, step one, two, three, and four and five. How can we create action with something like this without making, you know, slanting our text or something? But anytime you're reading through your document and you have an opportunity for some sort of stepped process, so any kind of process flow chart or something like that, we can make this actionable by making them little arrow, arrow graphics. Let me go back over into InDesign. We're gonna navigate down. So here are the, th the same five steps, a little grayer so you can see it better. But I wanna point out that with my selection tool, we can see the eight 
outer handles of the graphic. But if I go to the direct select tool, so that's the white arrow and click, that gives me the four editable points of this graphic. So if I just deselect off and just click, say, on this bottom left one and click and drag, we can see how we could edit that point. Now, what I want to do is have points across the middle so I can create kind of a cool arrow graphic. And I don't want to try to figure out where that is automatically. I'm going to use a script. And if you are brand new to scripts, again, check out uh, my handout because I have my favorite scripts as a handout. But this one is one of my favorites for really, really quick design. Scripts are located in the top menu window, utilities, scripts, and I already have the panel open. So top men menu, window, utilities, scripts. And the one I'm talking about is in the application folder, in the samples folder, and then in JavaScript. So we're in application, samples, JavaScript. I'm going to choose the add points script. So let me select over all of five of these frames and double click on add points. So as soon as I did that, if I go back to direct select, add points as new points halfway between existing points. So I now have eight actual editable points within my squares. So keeping direct select active, I'm just gonna click and drag right over the middle. With direct select, that's only selecting points, not the entire frame. And now I can either right arrow or shift arrow to create a really easy action out of text within InDesign, simply by using the add points JavaScript script. So lots you can do with scripts. And again, I have a handout on that. I'm, I'm checking the questions, which some of these will come back to. Okay, but I will answer this. Um, are scripts automatically in InDesign? Yes, they are. And I am so sorry to tell you, but the scripts panel was introduced in CS2. That was back in 2005. So the scripts panel has been here. In the application folder, in the samples folder, we have three folders. Now, UXP script is brand new to this version of InDesign, but Apple script for Mac users, Windows users, you have Visual Basic script or VBS script, and we all have JavaScript. So I have a lot of success with JavaScript, and most of these in this list have been here for a very long time. Now, there's a newer community scripts folder, so it's about five or six years old, and then you have the ability to download scripts as well. So great question. And the handouts, hang on to the end because I have a QR code to get to my scripts handout and my layers handout. Thanks for asking. All right, so we made quick work of some action in our text to add some additional interest. And now, Additionally, using leading lines. So leading lines are a photography tool to create interest within a photo of how your eyes are moving through photography. So in this case, we can see our eyes are moving back to that kind of bottom left quadrant. Here, the buildings are pointing us straight up to the sky. So what a great place to add a message. But what if, you know, the building is reversed. Same thing. It's static. The building structure is pointing us up to the top right. Add your message here. And of course, we want to follow directions. So anytime there are arrows, our eyes are going to follow the arrows. We just created some in the text. But that's not just arrows. It's also eyes and eye lines. So for this model, the first thing we see is her face. Then we look at her eyes. We follow her eyes right off the page. So we're looking at her line of sight, almost as a leading line that's going right off the page, in which case, if we simply move her, now we look at her face, we look at her eyes, we follow her eyes to a great place for a messaging statement. 
So if you have the opportunity to have a photo with a face, with the eyesight, the eye line going somewhere else, do not miss the opportunity to put a message there. I see it a lot now with resume headshots that are getting a little bit more playful and casual where people are looking off. Um, just make sure wherever they're looking, you have, you have some content and you're not just pointing people right out of your design. And it doesn't have to just be faces that have eyes. Uh, we look at the survey equipment and we see the lens and we can follow where the lens is looking. So sometimes you don't have a lot of faces, but you might have lenses or equipment that has lenses. So following lines of sight can be another way to really keep people interested in your content. Now, as a quick tie up to where we have gotten so far, this is a similar layout to what I showed you in the beginning that was that obnoxious red in the blue. So on this one, we have an image on the left and we have an image woman on the right. She is looking down right at our messaging statement for using technology for capital savings. Meanwhile, the photo on the left is wrapping around and we're following it again right into our messaging statement for using technology for capital savings. So sure, that could have been the heading that says project approach, but use those lines and where people are looking to really put a strong message right there. All right, let me do it on time. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, so for detail, so this is kind of the last area of our five. And the first tip that I wanna show you is by default, InDesign has enable dynamic spelling turned off, which seems terribly passive aggressive. So I strongly recommend you go into your InDesign's preferences settings. So that is Commander Control K to get you to the screen, navigate down to spelling and turn on dynamic spelling. So then when you're in normal view, so the view where you can see margins and things, you'll see when you have red lines for misspelled words or green for repeated words and capitalization errors. So that is a big one to help you with spelling. Obviously, hopefully you're already doing a spell check, which is command or control I. So definitely doing spell checks throughout. But another one is the ability to create a custom dictionary. So this is kind of a two-step process. And again, I have more information on this if you are interested, but it gives you the opportunity to create a custom dictionary for your firm. So all of those acronyms that you use all the time, the last names that are getting hung up in spell check, some of the other technical words that we use, you can add those to a dictionary just to speed up the spelling, check spelling process. So it's really helpful. Again, back in preferences, you can add a new dictionary and then from the top menu edit spelling, you can go access that dictionary to start to add words. And finally, the biggest one that most people are not even aware of is the ability to create a custom document profile. How many of us get all of our stuff in, we grab content from all over the place, we've put it in this document, we have an 11 point type minimum for this request. How in the world can we confirm that all of this content in here is not under 11 point? Like we cannot risk disqualification for something as silly as a font size. So you can create a custom document profile to do that. And I'm running out of time, but that's from the bottom of your InDesign screen. And you'll have the instructions here to be able to create that custom profile. Then you can search for throughout the document for 11 point minimum, and the document will find anything that's underneath that. So really, really have saved our bacon more than once on font sizes. All right, and just to end it up here, let's bring it all together. So I have a project sheet ready to go. I'm using the typography hierarchy, nice big project name. I'm using the subtle blue, so it's not overwhelming. My footer is not super overwhelming, but I'm ready to add two photos for this project. So I'm gonna go into open asset and take a look at the photos available to me for this one. 
And I have several here, but what I'm looking for most importantly are ones that have action. So kind of the top left in any photos that have leading lines back into the design. I'm gonna add those in here. And I also wanted the project manager because of course we want a nice big one of her. So here's the layout that I came up with. I have my project manager on the left and she's, her eyes are taking me right out of the design. So should I actually come back to it? I go to the top, I see the energy there, that's great. I go down to the bottom right, those leading lines are taking me right off on the other side. So this layout has completely taken the reviewer out of it. If I just swap them. So first we're gonna look at her, we're gonna look at her eyes. Her eyes are going to the nice big top image with some energy happening. That's gonna draw me down to the tables in the bottom left that has lines pointing right up to my project name. And now I'm gonna read the description. So it's subtle, but it can really make a big difference. Let's take a look at another one. So I have my open asset projects. I have a couple options here with some energy and some leading lines. So I picked this one, I have energy at the top, but once again, my table bar is leading me out of the, the picture. So if I have to use that layout, I would switch it with another image and keep the lines pointing me right back to the description. Or I could change the layout to the other side. But the next one is probably my favorite. So here is Willow House. And the reason I love it is this picture in the bottom left. Not sure what's going on there, but it's a really solid red that's going to draw a lot of attention. And we have leading lines. So in my layout, I'm going to make sure that that picture is on the top left. Those lines are going to point down right to my call out. My call out that just like this project that we're pursuing, this project sheet includes an elevated site. So giving them a differentiating message just by having them follow the lines from the photo. And with that, we covered a lot today and I still have time for questions. So we covered hierarchy and balance and repetition, action and detail. So thank you so much. Let me go to, I'm gonna to go to um, this page first. This is the QR code if you wanna access our mailing list and grab those two things I talked about, scripts and my layers article and the, the slides after this open asset will send out. And Derek, do you wanna, should we go through some questions? Yes, that was awesome, Julie. There is a lot of engagement on Q&A. Um, I have tried to, to highlight some key ones. You asked uh, the one about the scripts. So, or you answered the one about the scripts. And then there was another question. Will the recording be sent out after the web or webinar? Yes, it, it will. We will send that out. Um, but let's get into um, some others. So I think one question that popped up uh, was related to uh, recommendations. There's a lot of questions here. Um, sorry, I'm just coming through uh, some of these. What recommendations do you have for making a proposal stand out when you are restricted such as an SF330 proposal, limited page numbers, have to use certain fonts, et cetera? Yeah, so that is such a great question because I think the intent of the 330 is to put us all on the kind of a level playing field. But I always, I definitely add color. I add images in my 330s just to try to help them stand out. Um, I still will have little call outs in a 330 where I can. Kind of depends on the owner where you're submitting that um, and how much flexibility you have in altering the 330 for that sort of thing. But at a minimum, to at least get some color in there to spice it up a bit. All right. Awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, there was one quick question, maybe just a, a UI thing. What if you do not have the eyedropper tool under your tools? So I'm going to escape out of this. Let me go back to InDesign here. So the eyedropper tool, 
should be in your tools panel on the right. So it's been there for a long time. Um, if you can't get to it, just try shift I, as long as you're not in type, um, if you're in any other tool except for type, uh, shift plus I will is the shortcut to get to the color theme tool. So, or just I get you the eyedropper tool. So try those shortcuts if you don't see it. Great question. Um, awesome. Scrolling through. Um, I, this might be a good one. Uh, what are your top tips for including images with a two column layout? Do you have any tips? My top tips for including images in a two column layout, I still like bigger is better. So I often will try to have a hero image kind of spanning both columns. Um, that is my preference. Otherwise that kind of safe layout where the top left and bottom right are images can be really safe. Um, but those, you know, I, I'm not afraid to span a column with images for sure. So that would be my recommendation. Awesome. Thank you. There's a ton of questions. So I am like, uh, if I look like I'm staring, I'm just trying to make sure I, I get to some of those. Um, if there's any that jump out at you, Julie, feel free to, to jump in there. Yeah. Um, so, so Stephanie is asking about setting up to run as a pre-flight. Yes. I think she's referring to the document. It's actually the profile. So you would define a profile to find that 10 point or 11 point minimum. Then you would look at pre-flight. You would actually choose your new profile from here and then pre-flight would find those fonts. So that is correct, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. So when you make all of these changes, are they saved for use in all new InDesign documents? So I think you're talking about the preferences settings. Yes. The spelling preferences will, will be in all new documents and the dictionary will be available. Um, so I see you're using double page spreads. Are people doing that layout on proposals? Totally up to your preference and what the owner requires. We tend to actually use a single page layout because of a lot of the electronic submittals. If we're limited to eight and a half by 11, I want to make sure that they see it, even if it's electronic as eight and a half by 11, and they don't think it's 11 by 17 because it's a two page spread. So we tend to just use single page layout. Um, an easy way to import images into InDesign from open asset without downloading it. Yes, I, I love that, you know, you can click and drag from open asset to bring the images in. Technically it downloads a temporary one to your hard drive and then it will update, but it really is very seamless to use. So one of my favorite tools for using images in InDesign for sure. Sorry, I'm zipping through these here. And the question on turning on dynamic spelling, but the lines are still not appearing, uh, just make sure you're in normal view. So if you can toggle W as preview mode. If you can toggle between just hitting the W on your keyboard, as long as you're not in text and gets you to normal view. So that's where you'll see the, any kind of spelling issues. All right, what is my opinion on icon use? I think they're rather ubiquitous. Um, I think there's still value there because they're imagery and certainly can draw a reviewer to content, but I would use them sparingly in your document and not, not try to fill your 10 page proposal with 57 icons. So use them when there's a message attached. Um, so someone's asking to see how you import info and pieces from open asset into InDesign. So I did not do that in this session. I gave you screenshots, but I know Open Asset has a ton of content about that process. Yes, we can follow up with some content on our InDesign plugin and, and dragging and dropping as well as exporting into InDesign. Awesome. And then Bailey's asking to go over the add points script again. I'll just show you it's in the scripts panel. So that's window utility scripts. In application, samples, JavaScript, and you just have to double click on add points. Make sure you have a frame selected and double click on that script. 
There's a lot going on in scripts. It's so valuable. So definitely check, check on that. Uh, Julie, this might be a fun one. Any fun ideas for org charts to make them stand out and easier to create? Oh, wow. Yes, I have lots of opinions on easier ways to create org charts and to make them stand out. Um, there's a video. I did a YouTube video on automated org chart. If you want to look that up, I did it for Creative Pro a couple of years ago, um, building a three-minute org chart. So there's definitely ways to do that. I don't have any of that kind of geared up, but I would love follow up with me. I would love to give you more on that. Um, someone is asking how you grab an object that's behind another object. And I'm actually really glad you asked that. I'm going to move this on top of that one. Um, all you have to do is kind of put your cursor on top of the object and hold down the command or control key that toggles between anything that is in that exact place. So I hit this and you just hold down the command or control key. It will toggle between all of the different objects in that, in that space. So you can see I'm just clicking and they're toggling between those two that I moved way off to the side so you can't see them. Um, all right. Let's see. I've got a, maybe another good one for you, Julie. Any tips for situations where you have to be mindful of printing out the proposal um, as it relates to color? How do you make the proposal engaging with maybe out not using too much color? Yeah, so great question. Um, because sometimes it can look really way overdone, like you're in clown school. Um, I would say in your swatches, you know, use some of those analogous colors that are just near, near your main color. So if you're kind of in a blue spectrum, kind of using into the teals and kind of along that, that can make it a little bit less overwhelming. Um, that's kind of my main, where I like to go is, is using those analogous colors. And let's see, I'm going to um, question, are logos on every page standard? No, I am not a fan of logos on every page. I think your logo's on the cover. You might have the name of your firm in the footer, but I think adding logos to every page is just one more design element that's going to start to clutter up your overall layout. Um, Sean is asking, moving styles from one page to another can be a headache. Sean, reach out to me because I have a lot of opinions on that too. Um, and there are some things to make that process easier, but I don't have time in the next two minutes. <laughs> but I do want to jump back. Yes. Oh, sorry. Did you want to jump back into something? I just, well, I was going to kind of promote some upcoming okay. things um, just really fast. For those of you that were asking me a lot of training questions, I'm actually doing an all day session next month, July 19th. Um, it's in Fort Worth, Texas. And I know that you are maybe not in Fort Worth, but if you find yourself in North Texas in July, um, I'm doing a session on InDesign for three hours and then Adobe Bridge, which is how we can really get a lot of our content organized and search for things. But then in the afternoon, Courtney Kearney and I are teaming up to talk about AI, AI as it relates to content, imagery, data. So all of that, we have a full day packed full of content I did create an open asset promo code for 11% off because it's our 11 year anniversary of Schaefer Creative. So check it out. Um, there's, the, there's the code. But I also want to point out open asset is the premier sponsor of Amplify. So if you don't get to Texas in July, definitely get to Texas in August. In Austin is the national SMPS Amplify conference, Amplify AEC. I will be speaking on InDesign and Photoshop as a pre-con and then Open Asset is, I mean, what a privilege that we have them to actually be the premier sponsor of this event. So really, really exciting stuff. All right. Awesome. Well, I think that'll probably wrap it up. We have a ton of questions. We'll try to, to follow up on as many of these as we possibly can. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time and Julie on behalf of Open Asset. Thank you so much for for joining us and providing your expertise to this audience and this group. We really, really appreciate it, and we're excited about what the future holds. Awesome! Thank you so much. All right, take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your week. All right, bye bye.